Okay, folks, we are gonna, going to begin. And uh, for those of you watching online, the little delay tonight is I printed last week's quiz. And uh, one of our astute students noticed. I mean, thank God somebody noticed. Others were just thinking they're doing particularly well this week. <laughs> so uh, I'm, uh, I'm glad somebody uh, did notice. Let's begin with a word of prayer, shall we? Uh, Father, we thank you so much for our privilege to study the book of Jeremiah. And we pray, Lord, that this time tonight will be fruitful to grow us to the men and women you've called us to be. And as we get closer to the end of this study, we pray, Father, you'd help us to finish this race and to learn from you as you spoke through the prophet Jeremiah. Pray that you bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Interesting thing to note, we are tonight um, moving from chapter uh, 43 onward uh, to 46 probably. Um, but this will be the last new prophecy of Jeremiah tonight. In other words, it's kind of the end of his ministry now. Um, the rest of the book are prophecies that apply mostly to different time frames that have no real dating as to when he wrote them. Um, but the one we're dealing with tonight is a prophecy that he does in Egypt where he ends his ministry. And so that is uh, just interesting to note. So with that in mind, yes? Why did Jeremiah write that way? Or did someone else? We believe, so the, the question is, why is this book a hodgepodge of order? And we, he didn't phrase it that way, Wayne, but <laughs> I think that's what he meant. And uh, we think it is like a collection of sermons, prophecies that Baruch probably collated and put together, and he arranges it uh, arguably in a theological order, not seeking to be chronological. What's interesting, though, is the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures, written 200 years before Christ, they have a different order. Um, so it's hard to make an assessment as to uh, why it is we have the order we have now. <clears throat> Good question, imperfect answer. And uh, it's one of those questions that when you get to glory, you can ask that one again. Okay, with that in mind, um, let us uh, look at quiz 21. Quiz 21. First one is this. Wait a second, is this the other quiz too? I think this is the wrong one too. Arr, bear with me, folks. I have to see what happened here. Hold on. How could that be? Oh, the shame of it all. <laughs> I haven't done this very often. So, grace is the appropriate word here. Let's see. Okay. Actually, it's not... Okay, well, that's the right one.
I'm having a different problem now in terms of it's not showing up here. Hold on a second. Yes, sir. You mean I can do it old school if I need to? Yeah. Thank you. I think I got it yes. all right sorry about that um, for those watching online today I have had my humiliating moment here I handed out the wrong quiz and I actually posted on my PowerPoint the wrong quiz so it shows I was distracted today as I was putting this together so here we go starting again nine minutes late Gedaliah held what position in Judah? A, king, B, governor, C, general, D, ambassador. Anyone want to take a stab at this? It's the governor. So that's good. Number two, who heard about a plot to kill Gedaliah? Now this you have to like read the text or take extremely careful notes to know these next few questions because I mentioned names. Uh, Johanan, Bayless, Shaphan, Iakem. And it is Johanan um, is the one who comes to uh, Gedaliah and says that King Bayless has hired um, a man to kill you. And so Bayless is mentioned here, but it's not the one who uh, reports the plot. Bayless is the guy who theoretically originates the the plot number three what country wanted Gedalia dead Lebanon Egypt Ammon Babylon well considering Babylon appointed Gedalia I would say probably not uh, Lebanon doesn't play into the story at all nor does Egypt so it is Ammon um, and so that is where uh, the, the country that uh, seems to be wanting Gedalia dead. <clears throat> Number four, who performed the assassination? Ishmael, uh, Nathaniah, Mizpah, Shiloh. And the answer is, well, let me do an elimination. C and D are places, not names. So if you knew that, you could eliminate those two. And the answer is Ishmael. And the other name is his ancestry, but it's, it's not him. <clears throat> Number five, where was the perpetrator captured? Gibeon, Ammon, Mizpah, he was not captured. And the answer is D. He was not captured. This is one of those stories where like, this is not ending the way I want it to end. We want to have the happy ending. The bad guys get their comeuppance. And it didn't happen that way. Um, he survives. <clears throat> Number six, Keith Green, who is a contemporary Christian music artist from the late 70s. He died, I think, 1981 in a playing accident. But he was very, very popular at the time. <clears throat> Keith Green wrote a song, So You Want to Go Back to Egypt. Who else would have agreed with this sentiment? Let's go back to Egypt. Johanan, Azariah, Arrogant Men, Shafam. And the answer is the three of them, A, B, and C. And that's actually from like one sentence um, where it mentions all these names wanting to go back. Now, Shaphan, he is with the Lord at this point. He is the one who found the scroll in the temple under Josiah. And I just grabbed his name and put it in there. But he is not on the scene. And if he was, I don't think he'd want to go back to Egypt. Um, so those three other names. And arrogant men is what it's referred to. <clears throat> who is forced to go to Egypt? Jeremiah, Baruch, Gedaliah. David. 
Now, this was a gift from the gods. And so, if you got this wrong, uh, I, I mean, let's put it this way. Gedalia is, what's the problem with him? He's dead. And what's the problem with David? Not alive. Not alive. That's another way of putting it. So, it could be Jeremiah or Baruch, and it turns out to be both. So, that was potentially a very easy question. But you could say, but I, I remember us talking about a Gedalia. Yes, about his death. <laughs> um, movie that I thoroughly enjoy, my cousin Vinny. Um, he said, where, so where did you get that name, Jerry Callow? And he says to his wife, well, he was all over the paper. You didn't actually read the article, did you? Why? Because he's dead. <laughs> and uh, then he had to like quick scramble and come up with a new name. Um, but it was a, a funny scene in the, in the movie. So my wife, used, we talk to each other in movie language all the time. So when I'm quoting something incorrectly, she'll say, you didn't actually read the article, did you? <laughs> and I'm like, well, no, I did skim past it. And then she will correct me as to what it says. Number eight, Nebuchadnezzar eventually invaded Egypt in the year 627, 587, 568, 537. Now I'm hoping by process of elimination you could figure this out. We did give you the date last week. 627 is an important year. What happens in 627? Jeremiah begins his ministry. So I'm hoping one or two of you might have remembered that, but have been shy at saying it out loud. 587, we've been talking about the last few weeks, that's the destruction of the temple. Nebuchadnezzar just won over Judah, not Egypt. And 537 is when King Cyrus is going to say, you guys can go home from Babylon. So by process of elimination, you got 568 when uh, Nebuchadnezzar makes Egypt a vassal state. Number nine, Jeremiah likes to use props, just like Pastor Steve, sharp guy. What did he use this time? Stocks, clay jar, belt, stones. Now, all of them are props that he's used. So if your mind's going, yeah, he's used stocks. I carried around stocks with him. Very awkward moment uh, when they were having a conference. Clay jar, that's the one he smashed in front of the king. A belt that he had to bury, came back, it's all rotted. And finally, stones. And this was in Egypt. And uh, it was to symbolize that the people will be buried there. So... It is uh, stones. Now, Pastor Steve used an interesting prop uh, eight days ago in Syosset and online. Does anyone know what prop he used? Snake. A snake. Very good. Yes, that was a fun moment. First time I ever spent time holding a snake. A live one, yeah. Oh, it was a live snake. Yep. It was a ball python, a ball python, and it was an interesting experience to uh, hold the snake. Where but did you it, get it lent itself. Excuse me. Where did you get it? I got it at Petco. I found out you can buy a snake and have thirty days to return it. <laughs> it was on sale for twenty-five dollars, normally ninety-nine dollars. Um, so I did check with their policies and everything and they said it was fine and I I bought all the means to keep it safe and protected um, a heating lamp and all those kind of things um, but the point for those of you who are saying Steve I think you've pushed the boundaries of uh, props why, why, Steve? Why? <laughs> yes why why <laughs> well the passage as you may recall was when Aaron threw down his staff and it became a snake and his snake ate uh, Janice and Jambri's snakes. However, 
I was also making the point that my big idea was everyone's going to get to know the Lord. You will either get to know him in his grace and mercy or you're going to get to know him in his judgment. And grace and mercy were the people of Israel. Exodus 6, 7. You will know me, he says to his people. They will see him in his power. But then in Exodus 7, 5, he says to the Egyptians, you're going to get to know me too, except it's going to be in judgment. And so the idea was in holding the snake, previous to this, I only had book knowledge of snakes. And it is a world of difference to read about a snake and to hold one in your hand. It's just very, very different. And so now I have experiential knowledge, which is the Hebraic thought. Oh boy. So I had fun with it, I, I will admit. I was sharing to somebody earlier that uh, I uh, only have four more sermons to deliver. And so I have to make them count, make them memorable. And so that was to make it more memorable. There you go. Yes, exactly. Number 10. Did it bite you? They don't bite. Unless you're a mouse. Then it swallows you whole. <laughs> what city in Egypt did the people settle in? Ramses, Cairo, Thebes, Tophanes. And the answer is the last one, Tophanes. Now, as it turns out, it is going to be a situation in which they're going to spread out. And we're going to find that. And I now have to get rid of this PowerPoint and bring up the one that I should have had in the first place. Correct. Okay. So by way of review, um, we are now off this map of... Uh, the kings and governors, Gedalia is gone, and uh, this is the map of the Babylonian Empire. It does show conquering Egypt, but that will not be till 568 BC. Um, but what, what is happening now is the people are leaving and they're going to Egypt. Oh boy, this is the wrong PowerPoint too. This is pathetic. It's not your day, man. Yes, I, I am not sure what happened there. I think maybe the snake got into the computer, Steve. My apologies. I, I have a number of slides. You know what, I, I apparently erased what I did um, because I've just brought up every, oh, wait, 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 hold on. There is hope, there is hope. Okay. <clears throat> All right, yes, I have this. So this is where they came. So they went from Judah to Taphanes, which is near the, the Delta, uh, Delta region in the, in the north. But then you'll see they moved further down south, deeper into Africa. All right, now that makes me happy that I haven't totally botched my slides. So there's a, there's a little hope here. So let's open our Bibles now to chapter 43 as we uh, continue... Excuse me, I think I mean chapter 44. All right, just make sure I think I'm... Yes, chapter 44. And I think we're going to make it to uh, chapter 46 today. Um, you'll, you'll see how that unfolds. So now Jeremiah is in Egypt. And the word of the Lord comes to him. Verse 1. The word came to Jeremiah concerning all the Jews living in Lower Egypt. 
in Middal, Tephanes, and Memphis, and in Upper Egypt. Now, that means they have migrated. So Tephanes was first, but then you can see on the map, they have Thebes is uh, towards the lower part, uh, the, and all the way down to the bottom, which there is a, a colony down there, and uh, you can see closer to the Delta region is the other place that uh, he's mentioning. So what this tells us that time has gone by. So we are now past the, uh, you know, 587. This could be the 570s. Um, could even be, you know, 569. But it is, time has gone by because people have moved. Um, and this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. You saw great disaster that I brought on Jerusalem and the towns of Judah. Today they lie deserted in ruins because of the evil they have done. They arouse my anger by burning incense to and worshiping other gods that neither they nor their ancestors knew. Now that phrase might sound familiar to you. That actually comes repeated from Jeremiah 19 verse 4. And so this repeated phrase you're worshiping gods that aren't even from your parents. You know, people cut you slack if you worship the gods of your parents. Because they understand your parents are Catholic, you're Catholic. Your parents were Lutheran, you're Lutheran. People get that. Um, but when people make a big transition, they're like surprised. And that's what he's saying. Um, your ancestors never knew. Again and again, I sent my servants, the prophets, who said... Do not do this detestable thing I hate. But they did not listen or pay attention. They did not turn from their wickedness or stop burning incense to other gods. Therefore, my fierce anger was poured out. It raged against the towns of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem and made them desolate ruins they are today. Now, there's a pattern that is emerging here that you may be familiar with. And we actually taught about in the very first day of the Jeremiah class. And that is, this is a legal case Jeremiah is making. It starts off with a history of review. Let's look at your ancestors for a moment. Then it is a specific indictment as to what they're doing now. And then a final verdict. So that is the this, this way that Jeremiah is approaching this, it's a way he's been doing it for the entire book. So we're seeing that again. You would think that now, you know, he's retired in Egypt. You know, it's like moving to Florida. You know, can't you have a relaxed time there? At least, no. <laughs> Jeremiah is still in the tough position of having difficult words from the Lord. So verse 7. Now this is what the Lord God Almighty the God of Israel says. And there's going to be four questions. First one, why bring such disaster, great disaster on yourselves by cutting off from Judah the men and women, children and infants, and so leave yourselves without a remnant? Question number one. Number two, why arouse my anger with what your hands have made? burning incense to other gods in Egypt. Where you, uh, the next question is, where you have come to live? Now here, all through biblical history, there is this instruction, don't go back to Egypt. Do not go back to Egypt. You were freed. In fact, this year at the church, we're going through Exodus. The idea is that you left Egypt. Why are you going back to Egypt? You will destroy yourselves and make yourselves a curse and an object of reproach among all the nations on earth. Last question. Have you forgotten the wickedness committed by your ancestors and by the kings and queens of Judah and the wickedness committed by you and your wives in the land of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem? To this day, they have not humbled themselves or shown reverence nor have they followed my law and decrees I have set over you 
and your ancestors. Now, as I'm reading this, I like to always give you the test example. If this is my quiet time in the morning, what am I getting out of it? I think that's always a challenging question because they're like, I'm not getting a lot out of this, you know, in terms of reading this judgment description. But what really pops out to me is verse 10. To this day, they have not humbled themselves or shown reverence. That's a very simple description of what God desires of you and me, to humble ourselves. When we come across as humble, we win points. I mean, people respect humble leaders. When you come across as arrogant and you know all the answers, the opposite tends to happen, except for some very foolish followers. Um, I was in Florida last week, and I, I call, call it part of my farewell tour. And so I know I'm not going to get to Florida as much when I live out west, but I wanted to visit some Shelter Rock people who have moved to Florida. And, you know, they're precious to me. Well, there's, there's one woman from the Syasa campus. Her name is Beth Rickert. She takes care of her 92-year-old mom. I take care of my 93-year-old mom. And we met at a park to talk. And then we had dinner. We talked for five hours. Got to be one of the longest conversations in my life. And it's just like we have a great rapport of conversation. We talk theology, we talk personalities, we, we, the whole gamut. And what's nice is I can talk about the church and nobody's nearby, meaning I could like vent a little bit or, you know, something like that. I find it very medicinal, helpful. But in the course of conversation, we did have a little bit of a roadblock because she is a bit of a fan of a pretty famous preacher. Um, and for those of you who uh, you know listen to uh, internet, radio, whatever, you probably know the name. I'll mention the name, and I always like to be careful because I know this is you know recorded. I always want to be generally respectful of other preachers, but the preacher's name is John MacArthur. And now theologically, I have much in common with John MacArthur. But I find the way he presents himself doesn't have like the least bit of humility. In other words, here's the way I feel a preacher should speak. Um, like for example, let's say I'm speaking about women in ministry. And I believe in a robust view of women in ministry. Now women can <clears throat> preach and, and teach and, and do so many things in the church. Not all Christians share that view, but this is the way I tend to say it. I will have to disagree with my brother or sister who have a different view on this, and I'll explain. Notice what I try to do. I told them my brother, my sister, and that I have a different take on this. But I listened to my brother, John MacArthur, and he says, of course I'm a Calvinist. That's what the Bible is. Like, well, how do you speak with that confidence, eliminating roughly half the church or more that doesn't hold to Calvinism and speak with that confidence? Of course, I believe that all spiritual gifts ceased for our generation. I read the Bible. I'm like, well, not the same Bible I read. <laughs> you know, and so when I hear these bombastic statements, he doesn't win any points in my mind at all. Um, and, you know, the person I was having this conversation with was saying, oh, he's in Southern California and it's a bastion of liberalism. And, and so he has to stand against the tide. To which I said, well, stand politely against the tide. You know, because when you come across like arrogance, he was asked, what do you think of Beth Moore? And he said, go home. Like, be under your husband's authority. I'm like, why do you say things this way? I, you know, you, know you, can, you can be conservative and you can respond and say, you know what, I, I understand her ministry and I understand there are many people who value her ministry. As I understand the scriptures, I think she would be best serving caring for her family. Now, he's saying the same thing if he said it that way, 
but he's saying it gently, humbly, if you will. Particularly if you say, I understand people have different understandings of the scripture, but the understanding I see is this. That's why I'm pausing here for a moment, because this is the word of God to you and me and to them. I'm looking for humility and I'm looking for reverence. There's a great Psalm, Psalm 130. Oh Lord, if you kept a record of sins, who could stand? But with you, there is forgiveness. Therefore, you are reverenced. That is the humble attitude of our heart before God, recognizing he is God and I'm not. If you nurture those two attitudes, humility as you conduct yourself with your fellow human beings and reverence before God, you have a quiet time with your cup of coffee in the morning that can last you for months because you can say, Lord, how can I exercise humility today with my spouse, with my kids, you know, with my parents, all those kinds of things that help us understand humility. So that's why I like to look at a passage like this, which at first glance, oh, this has nothing to do with me. And then at second glance, it pops. And I realize this has a lot to do with me. I need to work on this and uh, continue our journey. So this is what the Lord says, verse 11. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, I am determined. Hmm, if God is determined to do something, it's probably going to happen <clears throat> to bring disaster on you and destroy all Judah. Now he's referring to Judah that moved to Egypt. I will take away the remnant of Judah who were determined to go to Egypt and settle there. So there's the nuanced approach. Those who went to Egypt, they will all perish in Egypt. They will fall by the sword or die from famine. From the least to the greatest, they will die by the sword or famine. They will become a curse and an object of horror, a curse and an object of reproach. I will punish those who live in Egypt, and he repeats it again with the sword, famine. Now let's add a fresh one, plague, as I punished Jerusalem. None of the remnant of Judah who have gone to live in Egypt will escape or survive to return to the land of Judah to which they long to return and live. None will return except a few fugitives. So he's not saying there will not be any whatsoever, but for the lion's share, if you went to Egypt, it's not going to go well for you. And that's the, the word of the Lord. So that is Jeremiah's last prophecy that he gives towards a contemporary group of people who are around him. We'll have a little bit more interaction with him, but it's tough. <laughs> you brought me here. And in this particular case, he is going to be dealing with those very same kinds of things because he's in Egypt. God will preserve his life. We don't have a record of his death but we do know that the Lord promised to be with him like a dread warrior all his days. So we assume he died of natural causes, probably in Egypt. He gets now pushback. And then all the men who knew that their wives were burning incense to other gods, along with all the women who were present, a large assembly, and all the people living in lower and upper Egypt said to Jeremiah. Now, this is just an interesting thing. Any of you take a boat ride on the Nile? Anyone here? Okay. The reason why, if you ever go to Egypt, it's an interesting boat ride to go up or down the Nile River. Being that the people are living on this map at different places along the Nile River, there is uh, the, you know, the probability that either Jeremiah had Baruch write this in a letter and it was distributed, but there is a sense that it may have been a live message. 
And so the commentator I read, he said, when I was riding down the Nile on the boat, I pictured I may have been taking the same boat ride that Jeremiah took in terms of he becoming an itinerant preacher about the people and the Jewish community that were settled in different places along the Nile. The next thing that pops in this first description here is the sudden emphasis of the women. Now, anyone who has half an eye notices that women have attraction to some things that men don't have any attraction to. I have not bought a Cosmopolitan my entire life. But I know women who have purchased Cosmopolitans, you know, or magazines like that, um, simply because that is a magazine targeting women. Um, apparently, what we are about to see is the worship of a goddess that was very popular among the women. And it's interesting, their husbands come along and defend their wives for supporting the worship of this goddess. And so we will see more of that. Verse 16, we will not listen to your message. You have spoken to us in the name of the Lord. We will certainly do everything we said we would. This is arrogance. I mean, we don't really give a rip what you say, Jeremiah. We will burn incense to the queen of heaven and pour out drink offerings to her just as we and our ancestors our kings our officials did in the towns of judah and in the streets of jerusalem at that time we had plenty of food and were well off and suffered no harm boy are their menu memories fouled here <laughs> they did not have a great experience but ever since we stopped burning incense to the queen of heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, we have had nothing and have been perishing by the sword and famine. Now, who is this queen of heaven? Um, we think this is an artist, uh, excuse me, this is actual uh, remnant. It's probably Ashtar, who is a Mesopotamian Canaanite god, or Isis from Egypt. Now, look at this last statement here. Oh, excuse me. Uh, the next line. The women added, so now the women are speaking. When we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings to her, did not our husbands know that we were making cakes and impressed, impressed with her image and pouring out drink offerings to her. So just for fun, I entered in Google this statement, Queen of Heaven cake. And this came up from a store in Brooklyn where they actually will make, um, sugar, uh, not, uh, I forget what you call that. Uh, shortcake. Shortbread. Shortbread. Embossed with the Queen of Heaven. Nothing new under the sun. <laughs> there is nothing new under the sun at all. So if you uh, want to get your own cake of the Queen of Heaven, um, you can Google it. And uh, I don't recommend it. <laughs> but it just... It's just nothing new under the sun. I just, I just find that so fascinating. And, and it's not like this is, you know, because sometimes Mary is called the Queen of Heaven. That ain't Mary. <laughs> this is obviously trying to mirror the ancient goddess. Um, and so it's present in our world today. Then Jeremiah, verse 28, uh, excuse me, 20 said to all the people, both men and women, who were answering him, Did not the Lord remember and call to mind the incense burned in the towns of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem by you and your ancestors, your kings, your officials, and people of the land? When the Lord could no longer endure your wicked actions and detestable things you did, your land became a curse 
and a desolate waste without inhabitants, as it is today, because you have burned incense and have sinned against the Lord and have not obeyed him or followed his law or his decrees or his stipulations, this disaster has come upon you as you now see. Then Jeremiah said to the people, including the women, hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah in Egypt. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, you, your wives have done what you said you would do when you promised. We will certainly carry out the vows we made to burn incense and pour out drink offerings to the queen of heaven. Go ahead, do what you promised, keep your vows, but hear the word of the Lord, all you Jews who live in Egypt. I swear by my great name, says the Lord, no one from Judah living anywhere in Egypt will ever again invoke my name or swear as surely as the sovereign Lord lives, for I am watching over them. Now get this next phrase for harm, not for good. The Jews in Egypt will perish by the sword and famine until they are all destroyed. Those who escape the sword and return to the land of Judah from Egypt will be very few. Then the whole remnant of Judah who came to live in Egypt will know whose word will stand, mine or theirs. Tough, tough words. Out of curiosity, how many of you have watched in part the, the series, The Chosen? Raise your hand. Okay. Uh, most of you. For those of you who haven't, I highly recommend it. Um, it is worth watching. Um, but one of the things that I absolutely love about The Chosen is we know historically that when you are a boy, it's incumbent upon you to memorize the first five books in the Bible by the time you're 13. Let's just imagine that. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Now, I have memorized quite a bit. I don't even come close. I mean, not even remotely close. If you were sharp at age 13 when you had your bar mitzvah, you were expected to then memorize the rest of the Hebrew Scriptures, the rest of the Tanakh, all the way to Malachi. But one of the things that the Chosen shows is that the guys, many of them, have done this. And they start quoting these vast sections of Scripture together. And the women that are following along with Jesus, they want to, they want to catch up. And people like Matthew, who was like, in cahoots with the Romans, he wants to catch up. And they're, they're just wanting to start learning these scriptures. Now, the reason I'm saying this, this scripture would be memorized that we just read. When you have these in your head, what means is that you can rehearse them. You can ponder them. Because our problem is we have a superficial reading, you know, while we're drinking our coffee, and we may never see this passage again for the rest of our life. I read Jeremiah once. Ain't going back there again. Boy, whoa, tough book to read. But they rehearse it as a part of their life. And it makes me wonder all the gold that is buried here that we miss because we don't reflect on it, regurgitate, if you will, chew the cud as the scripture actually implies. That's what it means when the scripture says, meditate on it, bring it back, think of it, chew on it. Because I think there's a lot here. What I would do if I was bringing this up, I would say, Lord, I see you said through Jeremiah, I am watching over them for harm. Father, Please watch over me for good. May my life not be one that I am doing the exact opposite of what you've told me to do. That would be a regurgitating of this for our benefit and our good. And the Lord gives this challenge. Let's see who wins in this one. And you'll see. My word or theirs. Verse 29. 
This will be a sign to you and that I will punish you in this place, declares the Lord, so that you will know that my threats and harm against you will surely stand. This is what the Lord says. I am going to deliver Pharaoh Hophra, king of Egypt, into the hand of these, his enemies who want to kill him, just as I gave Zedekiah, king of Judah, into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the enemy who wanted to kill him. Whenever you have little stories like this, this is an interesting time to say, do we have information outside of the Bible that confirms this? And we do. This, this Pharaoh, Hophra, I believe the year was 570 AD, is deposed in a coup and then later assassinated. Exactly what the Lord says through Jeremiah is what happens. It's one of those moments that those who are remaining in Egypt, when the news comes that the Pharaoh has been deposed and then assassinated, didn't Jeremiah say something about this? Uh-oh. Hmm. And the question is, would they do anything about it? Would they say, I think we'll go back to Judah? Or, ah, forget Jeremiah. Who cares? Thus ends the contemporary words of Jeremiah in his book. Now, we're not done with Jeremiah talking, but they're now going to be prophetic words for other periods and other peoples. But this was the last one he gives to his people directly. So we've come a long way, baby, getting this far, but we're not done. Now, this next little chapter, chapter 45, is a guy we've heard about, Baruch. So let's see what happens. Um, one scholar says this is kind of like Baruch signing his work. So this is a chance of him to tell a little story about what's going on with him. Now, <clears throat> when Baruch, son of Nera, wrote on a scroll the words of Jeremiah the prophet dictated in the fourth year of Jehoiakim. So now we are back in time um, under Jehoiakim's reign. And I'm going to pause here for one moment because we found in archaeology Baruch's seal. That is amazing. Um, it actually has his full name, Baruch, son of Nera, on this. And this was, you know, he's a writer. And to prove your authenticity, you would seal it with a wax seal or, you know, into something. And we have a remnant of his seal. These are all these things. You know, archaeology, by the way, is one of the youngest sciences that we have. People only started digging up things 200 years ago. And so this idea of the authenticity of scripture was not proved historically. People kind of just took it on its word. But then when the skeptics started coming, people started digging. And what they found is all these finds which verify the scripture. So here's one that verifies the scripture. So we read this, continuing on. In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, Jeremiah said this to Baruch. So we're looking at a, pa a prophecy that's dating back. Now, there are only two prophecies in the book of Jeremiah, two people, individuals. One you've already had, and that is uh, Obed-Melech. Remember who he is? He's the guy who saved Jeremiah's life when he was in the cistern, lifts him up with the rags around his arms and pulls him up. And the prophecy to obed Milik was, you're going to get away. You will live because you trusted the Lord. So this is the only other prophecy in the book of Jeremiah to a specific individual. Um, and I'm not counting the kings because the kings were representing people, you know, as a whole. And here's what it is. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says to you, Baruch, you said, Quote, Woe to me, the Lord has added sorrow to my pain. I am worn out with groaning and find no rest. 
So it sounds like Baruch has the same exciting feelings of Jeremiah. In other words, Jeremiah is the one who, you know, gives the, uh, the uh, receives the word from the Lord, but it's often Baruch who has to get the wrath of it. And let me show you where this happened. If you remember, this is chapter 36. This is when Baruch is reading to the king a prophecy of Jeremiah. They asked Baruch, tell us, how did you come to write all this? Did Jeremiah dictate it? Yes, Baruch replied. He dictated all these words to me, and I wrote them in ink on a scroll. Then the official said to Baruch, you and Jeremiah, go and hide. Don't let anyone know where you are. After they put the scroll in the room of Elishama, the secretary, they went to the king in the courtyard and reported everything to him. The king sent Jehudi to get the scroll, and Jehudi brought it from the room of Elishama, the secretary, and read it to the king and all the officials standing beside him. It was the ninth month, and the king was sitting in the winter apartment with a fire burning in the fire pot in front of him. Whenever Jehudi read three or four columns of the scroll, the king cut them off with the scribe's knife and threw them into the fire pot until the entire scroll was burned in the fire. And Baruch gets to be the guy who wrote this scroll and now has it burned. So I am just saying Jeremiah prays very, very forthrightly to the Lord. Remember Jeremiah chapter 20, Lord, you deceived me and I was deceived all day long. All you ever give me to preach is doom and gloom and I've had it up to here. But if I say I will not mention you or speak any more in your name, his word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up on my bones. I am weary of holding it. Indeed, I cannot. So that's Jeremiah's very honest prayer. You did this to me, Lord. You give me these awful sermons to preach. Baruch is feeling the same thing. The very same thing. Woe to me! The Lord has added sorrow to my pain. I am worn out with groaning and find no rest. Is it fair to tell the Lord that? Well, it's interesting. I mean, I think there are unjustified complaints that Christians have. You know, Lord, why did my cable go down tonight? You know, and like, sorry, that's not, you know, that dramatic of an event. But there are times in our life that difficult things just happen to us and we have no control over them. And I think if we're honest, we're going to go through a phase like Baruch. You have added woe to me and added sorrow to my pain. That's hard. We don't know exactly what he's referring to, but this is Baruch telling us what his joy has been being Jeremiah's scribe. He says, I am worn out from groaning and find no rest. And now the Lord answers, verse 4. But the Lord has told me to say to you, now this, that's what Jeremiah said, this is what the Lord says, I will overthrow what I have built. I will uproot what I have planted throughout the earth. Should you then seek great things for yourself? Do not seek them. For I will bring disaster on all the people, declares the Lord. But wherever you go, I will let you escape with your life. It's not the kind of like happy verse I want to read. I want to say, you've done so well, Baruch. You've stuck with it. You've hung in there. And what we have is a statement from the Lord of his sovereignty. I raise up. I bring down. And Baruch, let me talk for a moment about your own ambitions and plans. Give them up. Wow. That's hard. A few weeks ago, I was, uh, actually, I think it was uh, when I was preaching in uh, Syosset, I told the story of uh, listening to Tim Keller in a recent, fairly recent sermon. And he said, 18 months ago, 
I was looking forward to retirement. I was, you know, I'm going to be in the lecture series. I'm going to write books, all this wonderful stuff. And then I am diagnosed with fourth stage pancreatic cancer. And all those plans have a big question mark over them now. Who knows? And he said something very profound. Did you hear this sermon, Ken? I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure when he gave it, but he said 18 months ago. So that kind of dates from when he uh, uh, gave it. But the bottom line is, to, he said, to use a Jesus metaphor, I realized that my house was partially built on the rock. And a good portion of my house was built on the sand. And I was unprepared to realize that. Because don't we all want to say, you know, in the Jesus metaphor in the Sermon of the Mount, Matthew 7, that my house is built on the rock. And when the storms of life come, it stays firm. And what he said was very profound. He was preaching on Jonah. Now, if you recall the beginning of Jonah, when Jonah runs away to Tarshish, a storm arises. And it says that every sailor, and sailors are not known for their piety, are they? But it's funny how you find piety when you're in the storm. It said every one of them was crying out to their own gods. But none of the gods were coming through. But they had this guy in the bottom of the ship named Jonah. So they wake him up and say, cry out to your God. To which Jonah says, actually, the storm is because of my God. Throw me in and the storm will stop. And what Keller mentioned to make this contrast, he said, as much as I would like to tell you how grounded I was in the Lord, I realized that I had been worshiping the God of ego, the God of uh, pride, the God of um, materialism, you know, all these kinds of things, my little gods which turn out to be useless against fourth stage pancreatic cancer. And that's when he said, I realized I was building part of my house on the sand. And it's a moment in time to regroup and consider who and where you are. So Baruch is complaining, probably justifiably, because he's hanging out with Jeremiah and Jeremiah is like an unlucky penny. I mean, if something bad can happen, Baruch gets to be with him with that. But he's got dreams like Tim Keller 18 months ago. He probably wanted to move to Florida, you know, Fort Myers and, you know, buy a lovely home and uh, go fishing, play pickleball and all these other wonderful things that senior citizens that are healthy are supposed to do. And here's what the Lord says. Give up all those plans. Huh? Who thought? That's hard. Going back to Job, we've quoted this before, chapter one. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I got some good news for you, Baruch. You'll live to tell about it. <laughs> You'll have a depressing story you could share one day, maybe to your grandkids or something. What it says in the NIV is this, but wherever you go, I will let you escape with your life. The Hebrew is better translated. Your prize will be, you'll live. And another way of translating it is your booty. In other words, when you're winning a battle, you get booty from the, we can't use that word anymore, but you know, you know what it means. You'll, you get rewards for conquering an enemy. But what you'll get is you'll get to live. This whole paragraph, I found it very interesting because my commentator spent more time on this little tiny chapter than the whole rest of what we were going over tonight. He was just pondering the profoundness of this in the sense, here is a specific word to a person. 
And God quotes him, meaning God heard. My life stinks. Woe is me. Pain upon pain. And then God says, I do what I want. I raise up. I bring down. Don't make big plans for yourself. And uh, I'll let you live. There is a lot there to think about. As I read this, I'm thinking about April 16, flying to Nevada and beginning this new life. And then I say to myself, Lord, you might have something else in mind. Maybe I don't go. Maybe something else happens. Uh, Barbara, I wasn't referring to like I'm hanging out here. Maybe he calls me home. <laughs> So, I, I, there, I mean, yes, that's possible. The Lord gets to do whatever the Lord wants to do. That is true. <clears throat> but I think the main thrust of this, this little paragraph here is our lives are in his hands. He's given us life. Be grateful for it. I'm not, I don't think it means do not dream because this is is a prophecy to a particular person. In other words, I think there are people that God actually says, I do want you to dream. I was sharing with a, a young man who's going through seminary right now. And when I was at seminary, the only churches I had ever been to as a kid was Syosset Gospel Church, which was never bigger than 120 people. And then I went to Calvary Baptist Church in Port Jefferson, which at its peak had 350 people, which by Long Island standards, that was a pretty good sized church. Then I moved to Illinois to a church that had 150 people. That's all my experience. And so I'm in seminary and I, and I thought to myself, dare I dream that I might get to pastor a church of a thousand people? Is that okay to dream that way? And I, you know, my attitude was, Lord, it's in your hands. You could do what you want. But in the end, the church I was at as an associate pastor grew from uh, 70 to 800. I come here and I saw the church grow from 400 to the last Easter service at the Tillis Center we had was 3,000. And I was like, Wow, Lord, you are unbelievably and amazing. So in other words, from personal experience, I think God is not shutting down all dreams. I think he wants us to dream God-sized dreams. But sometimes, when you look at this, that's not going to be everyone's journey. We once did a message series that was entitled, In a Supporting Role. And it was about all the obscure people in the Bible that you just hear a little blip about. You know, it's say, you know all about David, but do you know much about Jonathan? You know, you, you know all about Jeremiah, but do you know Baruch? And what you find that they play a crucial role for the advancement of God's kingdom. But you know what? It's not necessarily one that got their name in the papers. In this particular church, one such name, which I don't know if any of you have heard of, maybe you guys, but the name is Harold Bushing. So Harold Bushing was the last deacon of the church in 1975. There were a dozen people here. They were meeting in this room over here, and people started saying, there's 12 of us. Maybe we should throw in the towel, sell the building, and give the money to missionaries. And Harold said, I don't think God's done with this church yet. And he decided, on his own, where do you find a pastor dumb enough to take a church of 12 people? You know where you find them? At the seminaries. Because at the seminaries, they still believe that God might do something exceedingly and abundantly beyond all that we ask or imagine. People my age, they're like, does it have a health care you know, policy? Is there a retirement? You know, they have zero interest in a church of 12 people. But a young seminarian, yeah. 
So they got this guy, his name was Dave Seifert, who got saved in the Jesus movement. So the movie Jesus Revolution comes out this week. The pastor who came on in 1975 is one of the fruits of the Jesus Revolution. He says, I'm a radical, long-haired guy. He comes in and his first Sunday had 17 people. So like, wow, good momentum. The next Sunday had 11 people again. Like, well, maybe not. Harold Bushing said, we couldn't pay people to come to church. But you know what? David kept at it. And after seven years, the church was 70 people. And you're like, well, that's not that great. He passes the baton to Brian Wilkerson. Brian found, found in those 70 people, they were the right 70 people. They were the ones who said, let's roll up our sleeves. What do you want to do, Pastor? And Pastor Brian begins to preach. I mean, he's one of the best preachers in the Northeast of the United States. Uh, if you want to listen to him, just go to Grace Chapel, Lexington, and you can hear how great the preaching was of Pastor Brian. He was here from 1984 to 2000. Um, and the church grew to 400. And, uh, you know, by Long Island standards, that was a good-sized church. And then, you know, I had the privilege of, of following him. But the point I'm making here is most of you don't know who Harold Bushing is. He's a Baruch. He was the guy who said, I don't think God's done with this church yet. Right before Harold died, he came to our Easter service, which was at the Westbury Music Fair, um, the NYCB uh, Theater. And we had about 2,500 that year. I wheeled him into the room and I said, Harold, look around. Thank you for believing that God was not done with this church yet. And that was his last Easter before the Lord called him home. That is the miracle of the people with the supporting role. And so do thank God if he's made you a Sunday school teacher, a youth group worker, somebody who hands you know, bulletins at the door. All of it is part of the journey of what God does through people. And Baruch is one of those people. That is why the commentator was just like, I need to spend a few minutes here to talk about him. Okay, now we move to chapter 46, which we're going to zip through pretty quickly, and then we're going to be done for tonight. We move to a poetic section, and when was this delivered? This is delivered based on the, the pieces, 605 BC. So we're back in time, and verses 1 to 12 is a word against Egypt about an attack they attempted against Babylon early in Nebuchadnezzar's reign. So verse 1 of chapter 46. This is the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet concerning the nations, concerning Egypt. This is the message against the army of Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, which was defeated at uh, Carchemish on the Euphrates River by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah's king of Egypt. So if you can go back in time, Babylonians are rising in power, and Egypt's like, I don't like this. So they join with the Assyrians to fight against the Nebuchadnezzar, and both are defeated. So here we read, prepare your shields, both large and small, and march out for battle. Harness the horses, mount the steeds, take your positions with your helmets on, polish your spears, put on your armor, see what, uh, uh, excuse me, what do, do I see? They are terrified, they are retreating. Their warriors are defeated, they flee in haste, without looking back, and there is terror on every side, which means you're getting your butt whipped declares the Lord. The swift cannot flee, nor the strong escape. In the north by the Euphrates, they stumble and fall. Who is this that rises like the Nile, like the river's surging waters? Egypt rises like the Nile, like rivers of surging waters. She says, I will rise and cover the earth. I will destroy cities 
and their people. Charge, you horses. Drive furiously, you charioteers. March on, you warriors, men of Cush. That is modern Ethiopia. And put who carry, uh, who, who, and put who carry shields and uh, men of Lida who draw the bow. But that day belongs to the Lord, the Lord Almighty, a day of vengeance for vengeance on his foes. The sword will devour till it is satisfied, till it is quenched with its thirst with blood. For the Lord, the Lord Almighty, will offer sacrifices, uh, sacrifice in the land of the north, uh, uh, in, of the north by the river of Euphrates. Now that's Babylon, the land of the north. I want to quickly point out something little here, verse 10. For the Lord, notice it's small letters for Lord. That means it is literally the word Adonai, meaning the master. But the next Lord is capital, L-O-R-D, and that is Yahweh. So Master Yahweh. I'm just pointing out the difference so you can see it as you go through. Verse 11, go up to Gilead. And get Bob, virgin daughter of Egypt. But you try many medicines in vain. There is no healing for you. The nations will hear your shame. Your cries will fill the earth. One warrior will stumble over another. Both will fall down together. Okay, that is the first prophecy. Now, let's ask the quiet time question. Morning quiet time. And this was your passage. What stands out to me is that the first part of this is all this pride of Egypt. Nobody can beat us. We're the Egyptians. In the ancient world, they were the strong power. But what you find out is pride comes before the fall. When I was in uh, junior high, I was a Christian, and in ninth grade, all the Christians that we knew of all sat at the same table. Um, we were at Stimson Middle School. Back then, it was called Stimson Junior High School on Oakwood Road. And uh, I was the annoying Christian because I would memorize scriptures to rebuke my fellow students every day, um, such as James chapter 4. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Weep, wail, moan. Then the next verse is, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. And every, every time I would go over on these things, they would all roll their eyes like, oh, here goes Steve again. You know. And uh, it was at that point that I started getting these inklings of one day being a, a pastor. I didn't have very good tack at the time. But this idea of humility comes through again. God humbles the proud and he lifts up the humble. That's something you can take away from this passage. Egypt was proud. Egypt will be humbled. We now go to the next prophecy about Egypt. And this is now 568 B.C. We do not know when he gave this, but it's fulfilled, 568 B.C. This is the message the Lord spoke to Jeremiah the prophet about the coming of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, to attack Egypt. Announce this in Egypt and proclaim it in Migdal. Proclaim it in Memphis and Taphanes. Take your possessions and get ready, for the sword devours those around you. Why will your, warrior, uh, why will your warriors be laid low? They cannot stand, for the Lord will push them down. They will stumble repeatedly. They will fall over each other. They will say, get up, let's go back to our own people and our native lands, away from the sword and the oppressor. They will exclaim, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, is only a loud noise. He has missed his opportunity. As surely as I live, declares the king, whose name is the Lord Almighty. One will come who is like Tabor among the mountains, like Carmel by the sea. Pick your belongings for exile, you who live in Egypt. For Memphis will be laid waste and lie in ruins without inhabitant. Egypt is a beautiful heifer. A gadfly is coming against her from the north. 
The mercenaries in her ranks are flattened calves, fattened calves. They too will turn and flee together. They will not stand their ground for the day of disaster is coming upon them. The time for them to be punished. Egypt will hiss like a fleeing serpent as the enemy advances in force. They will come against her with axes like men who cut down trees. They will chop down her forest, declares the Lord. Dense though it be, they are more numerous than locusts. They cannot be counted. Daughter Egypt will be put to shame, given into the hands of people of the north. The Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says, I am about to bring punishment on God Ammon, God of Thebes, on Pharaoh, on Egypt, and her gods and her kings, and on those who rely on Pharaoh. I will give them into the hands of those who want to kill them. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and his officers, later, however, Egypt will be inhabited as in the times past, declares the Lord. So two prophecies, and by the way, that's the whole end of the book. It's going to be prophecies against various nations. Today is Egypt. Now, you'll see chapter 47, it says a message about the Philistines. So that we won't do that tonight, but you'll see that. Now, the next little section is almost verbatim to the book of Consolation. Remember the book of Consolation? It was these uh, four chapters, I believe it was. And this is found in chapter 30, uh, verse 10 and 11, but it contains much of the same information. Do not be afraid, Jacob, my servant. Do not be dismayed, Israel. I will surely save you out of a distant place, your descendants from the land of their exile. Jacob again will have peace and security, and no one will make him afraid. Do not be afraid, Jacob, my servant, for I am with you declares the Lord. Though I completely destroy the nations among which I scatter you, I will not completely destroy you. I will discipline you, but only in due measure. I will not let you go entirely unpunished. So this last little upbeat section reflects the book of Consolation and is actually a verse, a set of verses that Zionists will use today in terms of why there is an Israel in the world as a place to defend the, the right of the Jewish people to have their own place to abide. Um, and that is our wrap-up. Last words of Jeremiah to the people following the beginning of his challenging. So if I can give my one closing statement, I always like to give you a little thing to chew on. When you read a passage, and it is a challenging passage, and you're like, what does my life have to do with the Egyptians? Nothing. And this is what I'm reading? You know, I'm going through the Bible in a year, and eventually you got to get through, you know, this section. Pause. Ponder. Reflect. Chew on. And what you find, huh, God really seems to oppose pride. God does restore. God does bring opportunity where there was defeat. But God does judge. You know, you, you put all these things together and it gives you something that you can walk away and think about all through your day as you're trying to, to grow in your Christian walk. So with that in mind, we're going to wrap up. Father, thank you for the opportunity we've had to to worship you through the study of your word. Father, there are so many things that I must confess a lack of knowledge about. You know, as somebody who studies your word quite regularly, I am very humbled as to how little I know and how little I understand. And yet, Father, you've called us to study your word, to learn it by which we may live the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that these things were written for us as examples. And so, Father, I pray that as we ponder and reflect, you would grow us to who you want us to be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys for coming.